Well, okay. Just want to welcome everybody here for the final uh, Samir Fest and uh, just say thanks again to Samir for his hard work and trying to put this, uh, putting this together. And so today the plan is, I think Samir should, was going to just sort of pull the threads together of what we've been learning about the last few weeks. And then we should all discuss or ask questions or, um, you know, take whatever, you know, discuss, open up the discussion to whatever we want to talk about in this context. So over to Samir. Okay, great. So I thought that I would just try to summarize what we have been doing through the four assignments. And uh, as we go through it, people should just, I'll just pause after every little bit and people should ask questions or, you know, we can go into a discussion so it doesn't have to be linear. So let me just begin with a, okay, let me try to share my iPad screen. So I'll just write on that. Okay, so can people see the iPad screen now? Yep, the, but just the black thing. Yeah, it's the black. Yeah, yeah. Black. Yeah. So first, let's just go back to see what's the uh, root of the paradox and the essential cause of all the problems at a colloquial uh, level is the fact that if you have, let's say, some big mass M here and a test mass little m here, and then they attract each other by gravity, then the energy of the mass little m, uh, it's equal to mc squared, the intrinsic energy, but then the gravitational potential is actually negative. So if I put them at a distance r, the whole point is that the gravitational potential is negative. And so you can see if r becomes small enough, then this can become zero. So let's ask when is this zero? And if you do that, you see that the m, little m cancels out, and you get the scale of the black hole radius. So you have this equal to this, little m cancels out, and you find that r is equal to gm over c square. So that's the whole problem that once you get close enough to somebody, and once you do it with general relativity, you just get an extra factor of two, but this basic idea remains the same. And so anytime you put yourself inside this horizon, you can have particles of negative energy. And so once you're going to have possibilities of negative energy because neg negative gravitational potential overwhelms the intrinsic energy, then uh, with energy conservation, you can make a pair of particles, call one of them B, one of them C, and the vacuum is unstable. So if you start with the vacuum around the horizon, it will keep spitting out these pairs of particles and the black hole keeps evaporating. So that's the uh, crude colloquium level version of it. But what we did was we actually learned the actual technical stuff behind it. And to do that, we then went through the following steps. First of all, you could ask, where do these particles that are created inside the C particles, like where do they go? I mean, you might think that after a while, they'll just clog up that black hole and then maybe the physics would change because the black hole is after all only so big and we want to emit so many particles. But we saw that's not the case because when you look at the actual metric, it's very interesting. The metric actually looks like it has a factor of minus two M by R and then the dt square plus one over one minus two m by r times d r square, and then the angular part r square d omega square. And so you see that at r equals two m, time and space switch roles. And because the switch roles, if you want to actually plot everything in some good coordinates where r is on this axis, and r equals two m is here, and r equal to zero is here, then far away a space-like slice would look like t equal to constant. But inside here, a space-like slice would look like r equal to constant, shall I say, r not. Okay. And so then you can, uh, to actually make a complete space-like slice, we had to use some coordinates, which were not the Schwarzschild ones, because these obviously fail at r equals to m. So then we learned about errington finkelstein coordinates. And so then I can write u over here. And then with that, we could see that you can make these things called good slices. So at least inside the black hole, the first lesson we learned was there's an infinite amount of space because r equal to constant is now a space-like slice. So the lesson was there is an infinite amount of space inside the black hole. So in a sense, this is going to be the root of all our problems 
because if there's infinite amount of space in the black hole, even forgetting any Hawking radiation or anything, you can just put a lot of stuff in here, which means you can have an infinite amount of entropy. And then you might ask if I put a lot of stuff, then doesn't that mean that it will cost me too much mass? And you know, I'm only allowing myself a budget of M for the mass inside this region. But that's not the case because as we have just noted above, inside here, you can have particles of both positive and negative energy. So the negative energy particles sort of go this way, positive energy particles go this way. And the way I'm drawing this now, since this direction is space, then this direction is time. So you can think of this entire evolution. If you try to move this closer and closer to R equal to zero, it's as if the slices were going to a big crunch. So if I just draw them, I turn around this way, then they're sort of heading towards a big crunch. And uh, these directions is space. So one direction is positive momentum, one is negative momentum. So what you ordinarily we call space momentum, of course, can be both positive or negative. And if, what as seen from infinity, because space and time have interchanged roles, these particles have negative energy and these have positive energy. So you can simply keep putting positive and neg negative energy particles well spaced apart on this infinitely long slice and hold any amount of entropy you want in there. This is sometimes called the bags of gold problem, but all these problems are really very closely connected because what will happen during the process of Hawking evaporation is that basically you will end up creating like a bag of gold. You will create the negative energy particles. You could keep feeding the hole that will be like the positive energy ones. You don't have to. Any way you look at it, you'll get into a problem. But the root of the problem is there's negative energy, net negative energy inside the horizon because of gravity's negative potential. And there's infinite amount of space in the hole. So entropy is unbounded. Any partition function you try to write will be unbounded because there are infinitely many states of the same energy and nothing is making sense. So we'll now actually go back to all the technical things we learned. But just from the uh, what we learned about the slices and the good slicing, we learned that there's infinite amount of space inside the black hole. And that was the purpose of learning about the eddington Wittgenstein coordinates or any other coordinate and seeing there's a lot of space in there. So let me just pause here to see if people have a question about this starting point. OK, so if that looks fine. Right, yeah, uh, somebody had a question. Uh, hello, can, can I ask a question at this point? Yes, please. Uh, yes, it's Tom Nicholas here. Uh, I think that I've got my, can, can, I, can you hear me? Yes, okay. it's a little bit muffled, but I can hear you. Okay, uh, I was just wondering at this point, my first question is whether this, uh, the way that the time, the, the, the constant time uh, outside the black hole becomes constant space inside the black hole. Yes. Whether this, is related to so-called Carroll geometry, where you have to uh, go infinitely fast to stand still. You know, first of all, that's my first question, and the second question is that the is whether the statement that there is infinite space inside the black hole uh, is it uh, is this does this hold if you disregard the singularity because. Of course, if there's a singularity, an infalling observer is going to disappear in finite proper time. Okay, so I don't actually know much about chiral geometry, if that's the word you had used. So Carol, let me know Carol. I, yeah, chiral geometry, yeah. yeah. So I don't know much about that. So queen. Just address the second part of the question. So it's very important that you can actually make complete space-like slices while not going near the singularity. So let me mention that in terms of the other problem we did, which was to look at the Penrose diagram because the Eddington Fickerstead coordinates are good because in that the metric is independent of U. So you can, U is like a time, so it's like a time independent metric. But if you look at the Kruskal coordinates, then you, it's best to look at it because that tells you the light cone structure. And then the good slices, which we showed above, these slices over here, they will actually look like uh, slices like this. And then the later slices will go up like this. They're all space-like now because in the Penrose diagram, the light cones always point like this. Uh, it's clear that the space-like slices are going to look like that. But then the point is you want to do the following. You want to capture all the infalling matter on your slice because everything relevant to the physics should be on my slice. So I can capture it when I'm away from the singularity. And then if I also want, I also want to capture all the Hawking radiation. So I first go up in time for a long time and then bring it down like this. So if I keep doing this, it turns out that I can actually make a slicing which never goes near the singularity. It captures my outgoing quanta B and it also captures my infalling quanta which I call C. 
And so the in, 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 in falling matter, sometimes I use A for that. That's why the other ones were called B and C. Uh, so all of A, B, and C, everything in there, which starts from, you know, in the initial slice where there was just the shell and then everything happened, it all evolved. It all stays in the domain of low curvature. Now you don't have to do that. You can obviously make your slices go close to a singularity. But then somebody could say, well, who knows what happens at the singularity? So there would be no sharp puzzle to pose. You could always try to wiggle away. But if you're always in this gently curved region, then it becomes a very sharp puzzle. And these slices are just these. And where I'm saying I don't go near the singularity, in the Penrose diagram, it seems I'm going near the singularity. But that's only because we are crushing the metric by a conformal factor in trying to draw it. Those slices are actually just these slices. So in fact, if you keep not letting them advance much in, much in the interior, a little bit here, you can see you're not going near the singularity r equal to zero. And so that's the best way to draw the slices. So what this is what we had to can, you, can you control whether you're not going near, near the singularity? You can't really, can't you? You can, because I'm just drawing a sort of space-like slices. And in general relativity, you have the idea of many finger time. So I can advance the slice ahead on one side and not advance on the other. That is my choice. Whether that fact actually leads to any consequences, it's a valid question to ask. My own investigation of that suggested that it actually can lead to no consequences. But if you somebody wants to argue, no, if you advance more on one side, less on the other, it leads to consequences, then one should discuss that because that's a part of the issue to do with the information paradox. But I couldn't find any consequences of that. And as far as I know, nobody else has also been able to find any consequences of that, in which case I can just use GR to evolve my slices and I evolve them differentially on the two sides. I'm not advancing them here and I am advancing them there. Thanks. Okay, do people have other questions? Or maybe I should I just move on to the... I should move on, I think. Okay. So then what we learned was, let's actually see how the Hawking radiation comes up. And the Hawking radiation was coming because these slices were actually going to stretch because if this was one slice, the next one actually had to be longer. And it was very important that the black hole geometry cannot be sliced by slices which are the same from one time to another. Like in flat space, all the slices are the same. At least you can choose slices which are all the same. And then if the slices are all the same, the lowest energy state on this slice, well, it will then uh, just remain the same at all times and there will be no particle production. Even if you have a star, suppose you have a star like this, now, uh, the, the wave function are not the same as those in flat space, but if you try to solve box phi equal to zero, you know, the wave function might wiggle more where the potential is lower and then, you know, wiggle less outside. There'll be some different modes. So here, if the modes were e to the i k x, here there might be something else. Let's just call them f of x. But the point is you always quantize the field. Here you would write e to the i k x minus i omega t and multiply that with a hat and then add the complex conjugate. Here you would take the field phi multiply them by f of x e to the minus i omega t and add the complex conjugate that a hat. So in fact, you can quantize this, the field identically around any background where you simply solve the wave equation. And if all if the metric is independent in any set of time, independent in any set of coordinates, you simply get a new set of functions fx. They may begin a little more where the potential is deeper, begin less when it's outside, but they're just some functions. And then the ground state, which is killed by all those guys, will be the ground state, it will stay where it is. But in the black hole, the important thing is you cannot actually slice it with slices which are all the same. And in fact, you can see the slices are always stretching and that's why the particle production keeps going on. And we had seen that if, because of the stretching, you create pairs of particles, one out, one in, we had called them B and C. And then if you look at the actual way that these particles are being created, they will typically be in an integral state. So the fact that stretching space-time leads to particle creation, that shouldn't be surprising. It's just that a changing metric leads to particle creation. You don't have to stretch space-time. You can just talk in terms of field theory, where you fix the space-time and just say, there's a variable called the metric, and the metric is changing. But when you change the metric, particles are created. That's exactly like if you change the electric fields in this room, then you create photons. And that's something you see all around you. For example, if you look at a you know, your music amplifier, there's so much interference. The electric fields in one region keep generating photons, which create interference in other places. So you keep trying to shield your electronic components with, you know, coaxial cables and all that. But just the same feature, you know, everywhere electromagnetism, that changing electric fields 
will just keep uh, spitting out radiation all over the place is exactly what's happening here. Changing gravitational fields are also always going to spit out particles. So electric fields spit out photons because photons come into the electric field, but uh, gravity couples to everything. So you're going to spit out basically everything if you start changing the metric. The only important thing about the black hole as opposed to anything else, is that if you took a star of radius, let's say R, and it you know, collapsed and became a denser star of radius R by two and stabilized, then the metric was time dependent for some time. And you create a few quanta with radius of the order of R, one or two quanta, it doesn't amount to much. But with the black hole, because space and time have interchanged roles inside the horizon, you can actually never get rid of, you can never come to a situation where the space-like slices become identical to each other. So as long as the horizon is there, it keeps spitting out particles and you keep creating them. So that was what the whole story of particle creation was. And we learned how to do that technically. So we said, you take your black hole space-time and any quantum field which satisfies box phi equal to zero, and let's say box phi is a quantum field, you can represent it by bunches of balls and springs, and then in, the, in some appropriate limit, these coupled harmonic oscillators, they just describe a scalar field. And so all that you need to know is that if you take this and you consider particles, one of which is inside the horizon, one of which is outside, and the space-time actually stretches, becomes like this, then it's equal to saying that the coupling between these oscillators actually became weaker. And we saw that was the case because the Hamiltonian had a term grad phi square. And the grad phi square is like saying, if this is 0.1, this is 0.2. It's like taking those two oscillators, taking the value at 0.2 minus the value at 0.1, dividing by delta x, that's grad phi, squaring it, but then multiplying it by g upper x, x. So this term is that. And then if you just keep the delta x is whatever, the coordinates are the same, but the metric there increases. So g x x lower x x goes up because I have stretched them, then g upper xx goes down. And you can see the coupling between phi1 and phi2 will go down. So it's basically like saying you start with coupled oscillators in, a, in the vacuum of a quantum field theory. And when they are stretched apart in this process of stretching, it's as if you weaken the coupling. And we did a toy example, which actually captures everything that we need. If you start with two coupled oscillators, and then you go to a go to this, decouple them at some time suddenly, then the state you end up with is entangled. You don't get the vacuum of the first times the vacuum of the second. You get that plus a little bit times the first state of the first times first state of the second and so on. So then we made a toy model of our entangled state. And we said from now on, the entangled state, we'll just write it as zero, zero, zero of the first will be called it B, zero of C plus one of B, one of C. So you can write this, this kind of a tangled state and essentially everything we had to do was captured by the story model. And we, so we learned that black holes, why do they create particles? Where do the particles go? They go on this infrared long slice. The process keeps repeating and the entanglement between the black hole and the, the hole can become smaller, but there's the radiation and the entanglement between the radiation and the black hole just keeps going up. So then if you start plotting these graphs where time is over here and the entanglement is over here, S ent I use for entanglement, then the entanglement keeps going up. So that's what got us into the black hole problem because then when you get to the end part of evaporation, then what happens? So that was the puzzle. So this is what we did in assignment two. We completely understood that once you have the structure of the black hole, uh, just by the stretching of slices, we'll keep creating particles and the particles will be entangled. And so the entanglement will keep growing and then we don't know what to do with it. Okay, so this was the structure of Hawking radiation. And so let me pause here and see if people want to have a discussion about aspects of this. Okay, does anybody have a question? Or should I just move on? I, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> so what happens as, as length stretches? What happens, I'm sorry if it's noisy, I'm in Central Park. Uh, what happens, um, if, um, uh, what happens to the wavelength? Are we still in the quantum regime or do we enter the classical regime? So the wavelength uh, becomes longer for a while. So what is happening is if you look at these slices, you first think of a mode which is, has very uh, shorter, short wavelength. And then as the slice stretches, that wavelength is becoming longer. And so it's that particular stretching which is actually giving the fact that the wave, even though it was in the vacuum state at this point, 
It's not in the vacuum state when it has been stressed. It has actually a quantum B here and a quantum C here. And when we went to the paper of Giddings and Nelson, we found that if you put these modes in the vacuum state, then on this slice, you will, uh, on this long slice, but once it has been stretched, you will get a mode which is sort of excited over here, then nothing here, and then excited over here. So this and this will be in an entangled state. But once you stretch it, go to even later slices, then nothing happens. The stretching is only in this region. So this quantum basically then moves out and at later times keeps moving out, but with no further stretching. And also the particles which was deep in here, that stays fixed because we're not even changing this part of the slice. We just keep uh, you know, uh, stretching this part of the slice. So essentially, if you like it, uh, the picture is like this. You start with the slice, then you uh, a long slice like this. You take some segment of it here. You stretch this segment. And then this creates a pair of particles by the stretching. So here the modes are stretching. And the other parts just move apart. And then when you stretch it again, when you again take the middle part and you stretch it again, then this will create a new pair of particles. But this pair of particles will just move out without further stretching. And this guy will also just move out without further stretching. So you create new particles because of the stretching. But the particles you've already created earlier steps, they are just moving out at later times and they just go, go further out. So there's no continuous stretching of the particles which have been created. So if this is for the, a solar mass black hole, then this particles have saturated at a wavelength about three kilometers and then they stay at the wavelength of three kilometers as they keep moving out. And the same for the particles which have fallen. So there's nothing like entering a classical domain for them. They're just like photons, let's say. Uh, photons are always quantum. We are, don't have a condensate of photons because they are created one by one. So you're always in the single particle approximation. So since you don't have a condensate of photons at any point, they're like spaced apart by three kilometers and their wavelength is three kilometers, you will never get a classical electromagnetic field out of this. Okay, were there other questions on this issue? Thank you. Okay, so then uh, the next assignment, we started to play a little bit about what is entanglement. And so entanglement just meant that if you have like two spins, let's say spin up and the other particle is spin down, then this would be a factored state. But if you add something like down up, and then you have to normalize the whole thing, this is what is an entangled state because the first spin, let's say one for this, two for this, first spin, second spin, the first spin doesn't have a state by itself. Uh, it's up if the other guy is down, and it's down if the other guy is up. If you just ask what is the state of the first spin, uh, that doesn't have any meaning. So that's fine. Entanglement just doesn't create any problems in quantum mechanics. It's a natural part of linear superposition because if this can be a state and this can be a state, then there's some has to be a state. So this is just part of normal quantum mechanics. And these two particles, one and two, they can be arbitrarily far from each other. One could be here and two could be on Mars, but that's okay. They can still be entangled. So having entangled particles and having them far away don't, doesn't create a problem. With a black hole, the point is that if this particle was entangled with this, let's say this is like the radiation particle, and this is like the particle in the black hole, and then the black hole vanished, then there is a problem because this guy is entangled, but there is no partner for it to be entangled with. So this guy has a doesn't have any definite state. But normally what you would say is, okay, if particle two doesn't have a definite state, you go find its partner and overall then everything has a definite state. But if the partner is gone from the universe, then this guy doesn't have a definite state and there's no way to think of some complete system which then has a definite state. So that's a violation of quantum mechanics. And this is what the information paradox was, this is what Hawking was worried about. So then we tried to wonder about this issue that uh, has been coming up in the recent wormhole ideas. So what has been happening with the wormhole people is that what they seem to be trying to fight is what is called the small corrections theorem. Samir, can I ask a question here? Yeah. Uh, you were saying that if the black hole was to vanish, but supposedly if I start with some scalar field and I collapse it to a black hole in an otherwise empty universe, um, and I have the black hole that will be in vacuum, it will evaporate eventually. Um, and we just don't know what happens when it evaporates, but it's not like it just vanishes and nothing else happens. Is it, I'm asking, is it, is it just that our lack of like what happens after the black hole evaporates that causes is also a reason for this paradox? So not quite. So what happens is that you the, first you follow the paradox up to the point where you have all these quanta B1, B2 up to Bn. 
and the hole actually contains all the C1 or C2 up to Cn. So at this point, the black hole, let's say, is at 10 Planck masses, and you still think you can basically trust your semi-classical intuition because there's only one scale, the Planck scale. So till you get to the Planck scale, it's okay. And so let's say 100 Planck masses, wherever you are comfortable. Okay, so the problem is already here because from now on, whichever option you choose, you are stuck. So what are the different options? You can say that this black hole completely disappears and doesn't do anything to these particles. Well, then that's the problem I was just talking about. And these particles are in a mixed state, they are entangled, but there's nothing they are entangled with. So then we have information loss. But as you said, we don't actually know what happens to the black hole. It may not evaporate. So let's go through other possibilities. So we will go through all the possibilities and because each one gives us trouble, that's why we have a paradox. So what's the other possibility? The other possibility is once it gets down to Planck length, it just stays there. So that's called the remnant. And so this time we have a different problem. It's not as serious a problem because you have these quantum B and they're all entangled with the remnant and the remnant contains all the seeds. So at least you can say it's okay. But the problem is inside the remnant, you have to fit infinitely many guys because if there were, let's say a million Bs, then there have to be a million Cs, but you could have started with a black hole, which was even bigger. So that could be a trillion Bs and then you need to fit a trillion Cs. So inside Planck, inside this Planck remnant, you must have infinitely many states. Now that creates problems because normally you cannot fit infinitely many states in a tiny volume, but you could still say there is some way I could do it. And then it's okay. It's okay means you have to justify how you do it in your theory, but that's called a remnant scenario. And many GR people want that. Like if you ask Bob Wald what happens inside the black hole, he doesn't believe in string theory. So he would say, I don't want the information to come out. I don't, can't see it coming out. So inside the remnant, he would say, inside the Planck remnant, there's a baby universe and then things are hiding in the baby universe and I can store anything I want inside there. Now there are other problems with the baby universe, right? So then you have to go to those problems. But you could call this, if you had, if you were, had some way of avoiding those problems with the baby universe, you could say, I'm okay. So uh, these are your options. Or, or you could try a third option, which were the wormhole people are saying that this everything goes into the remnant and then you can uh, have non-local interactions. So there's a wormhole. They say many different things, but I'm just put it on one version, which you could sort of extract from the papers. All these quanta C, they could leak out through this wormhole and reach infinity, and then there's nothing inside the hole, and then it can evaporate. So it's not like there is, because the black hole vanished, there is a problem. Once you get down to this point where the, the mass is very small, but the entanglement is very big, whatever you do, there is a mystery, right? Because normally something is very small, you cannot have a big entanglement with it. Like if I want to have an entanglement with your room of let's say 1 million units, your room has to have 1 million states because an entangled state always has the following form. Psi is equal to summation I equals one to some number N, some number of the state of the first system, then to some state of the second system, and then to normalize it one over root N. And so the entanglement entropy of this is between the first system and the second system, let's say first is the second, this is going to be log N. That's the basic, uh, you know, for the simplest uh, way of writing an entangled state. So if you have, this is, this is what entanglement is doing. If our entanglement is uh, like a million, if n is equal to 1 million, then this is, system needs to have a million states. So the question is, where are the million states? The guy vanished, there's no state. That's the most extreme way that Hawking got into the puzzle. If you make a remnant, you have to ask, how can the remnant hold a million states or infinitely many states really? And so that's your problem. And if you say, no, no, I'll get them out of the remnant somehow, so it doesn't have to hold those states, then you have to use some non-local effects to get it out. So you can do that. So all the different resolutions of the paradox, uh, you, you can go through all of them one by one, but once you have the situation that a tiny guy is heavily entangled with something outside, whatever you do has problems. So uh, the okay. only... Just one question here. Uh, why, isn't there an why isn't there an option where, I don't know, maybe around 100 M Planck or before or after, uh, something, some physics that we don't understand happens and I don't know, it explodes and releases all those states in some way. Okay, so that's a very good question. So suppose you have this tiny remnant and right now it has all the C1 to Cn and here you had the B1 to Bn, right? And you can say once it becomes very small, it just explodes and you just get normal quanta C1 to Cn and now it's okay, they're just normal quanta. And the reason this can't happen is actually very interesting. Suppose you emitted, uh, you know, like you have a solar mass black hole, you emitted 10 to the 77 quanta. Okay? So that's what you get from a solar mass black hole. Okay. So now there are 10 to the 77 of these guys. It turns out 
that to emit them, you can't do it quickly. You need a very long time. And the reason is the following. Your total energy is just M blank. So each quanta, and you want to carry 10 to the 77 bits of information. So each of them has to have a different spin. Okay, so you need to emit 10 to the 77 different bits, right? So if you want to emit 10 to the 77 bits, each one have, the energy of each guy is now 10 to the minus 77 M blank. It's much less than the energy of the Hawking quanta. Okay, this is now a tiny energy for each of the guys. Okay. And now the point is, you might say, okay, they have a tiny energy, but I can just emit them. And the interesting thing is you can't. You can only emit them one by one. Okay. And if the wavelength of them is very long, if the wavelength is R, it turns out you can have to first finish emitting one and then emit the next and then emit the next. You can't emit them all at the same time. And then you ask, okay, why not? Why can't I emit them at the same time? And the point is, if this is your tiny remnant here and you say you emit them, so there's some quantum field here, right? You could emit into some scalar field there. It's a bosonic field. Okay? If there were fermions, you anyway can't put two in the same place. So you have to emit them one by one. But let's do bosons. If you take bosons, then if you have like say n bosons here, there are very few states of them. Because if I put n bosons in a box, suppose you have a wavelength r, and I put them all on top of each other, then what are my possibilities? They all have a spin up and a spin down. So they're identical bosons. I can have all of them in spin up, or I can have all in spin up except one in spin down, or three in up and two in down, like that, right? So there are only n, n plus one possibilities. So they're not two to the n possibilities, only n plus one, because they're identical particles. Mm -hmm. So when you start thinking about how you will emit them, you can't emit the amount of entropy you need, which is the two to the n orthogonal states, in a time which is the time that you need to emit it is of the order of m cubed. And so that is possible. So it's actually not MQ. I think it's M to the power of four. It's longer than the time of Hawking radiation. Hawking radiation takes M cube, M over M Planck cube, but this one takes a higher power, M to the four. But that is possible. And this is what is called a slow leaking remnant. But because it takes longer time than the Hawking radiation to evaporate, all the problems you had with remnant that you were storing that much information in this Planck mass thing for such a long time are still there because the guy can't explode instantly because it has that much data and it can't give it up. But slow leaking remnants are so not possible. Is, is it easy to see why it's m to the fourth rather than m to the third? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, not, yeah it's m to the fourth because with the ordinary black hole, the amount of mass you had for emitting the same information was m, right? You had a mass m and you split that mass among all these little quanta. Now this time your budget is only M Planck because you've gone to most of it, right? So you lost one factor of M over M Planck. So each guy has a short, has a longer wavelength. So it's either M to the four or M to the five, I forget which one. But you simply have to say that the difference is that earlier the mass was more. So if you emitted 10 to the 70 quanta, the wavelength of each of them was given by M divided by 10 to the 70. But now it's only M Planck divided by M to the 70. So the wavelength of each one is longer. So because the wavelength is longer, it also takes more time. Well, I think maybe M to the five. So that's what's called a slow leaking remnant. And uh, because it's a slow leaking remnant, it's a possibility, but because it's trapped in there for times long compared to Hawking evaporation time, much longer than Hawking evaporation time, all the problems with the remnants are still there. But you can ask who does this model? So if you look at what people like Ashtekra are saying with loop quantum gravity, they actually have this model. So when they draw their Penrose diagrams, they will actually find that everything has gone into the singularity. And the Hawking radiation which has come out uh, doesn't actually carry the information. It's, it's the Bs are here, the Cs are here. And then they will draw this. And then they'll say that after this point, there is another world which you, can, which you go to, and then these guys come out. So they draw something like this here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there are many models like this. Sometimes people say you can connect a baby universe to the singularity and come out on the other side. They have Professor Brandenburger saying that. But essentially, these are models of slow leaking remnants. There are papers of Smolin saying that and so on. So it's a possible model, but it's like a remnant model. A remnant could either be completely stable so it stays there, or you could like let it evaporate slowly, but you can't let it evaporate fast. If it could immediately explode and give everything out, there was actually no puzzle because as you said, somebody could say, I don't know what happens with the Planck scale. Maybe when it goes there, it just ignites, gets everything out and I'm good. But because of this uh, 
the Bose and Fermi problem, it actually can't. But what's the problem with waiting that long? I mean, pardon? What is the problem with waiting that long? I mean, already a black hole takes a few times the stage of the universe to evaporate. So, no, there's no problem. So you could have it, have it as a model. The only thing is you still have the same problem of actually being able to keep remnants for a long time because you have to then say, how did something of Planck size hold an arbitrary amount of information for such a long time? Ah, okay. Because you still have to fit that information in there, right? You could start with a black hole of arbitrary size and in that Planck mass remnant, you still have to hold that information for a long time. So the question of how do you put that many states in there is still there. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Yeah, if it had become the Planck size thing and immediately blew up, you didn't have that question. But yeah, that was the image I had in the beginning, but now I understand. Yeah, thank so you. Is, is there anything wrong with just simply saying there's, a, there's another universe on the other side that's containing all this information and just sits there for all time? So stable remnant again? Yeah, so all these models are what the GR people do, right? So let's look at yeah. Bob model, right? That the baby universe is there. So this neck is only Planck size, but in here there's a baby universe that you could call that the other universe and you store things in here, right? So what are the problems with that? Well, so the problems with that are of the following kind. You actually can't make a baby universe. So all these problems sort of go down to this thing. It's difficult to make a baby universe because if you if some neck narrows and then opens up again, and you want this thing to be stable. So you're looking for a geometry where a slice narrows and then increases again, right? So the geodesics are going like this and then they increase again. Then this is actually forbidden by the Raichaudhuri equation because once something starts focusing, it can't defocus unless you have violation of the weak energy condition. So then you say, okay, I'll violate the weak energy condition because in classical gravity, we don't violate it because we don't know how to violate it. But in quantum gravity, you have like Casimir energy and so on. So maybe locally, you can try to violate the weak energy condition. And so then at the neck, if you have some kind of Casimir energy, which is negative or effectively negative, then for quantum reasons, you could violate the weak energy conditions. And then you could actually open up into a baby. Universe. So you can't fight that. It's a, sort of an ugly solution. And there are many other things which will be problems with it. But the simplest and first thing, which uh, at least gives me pause for thought, is that actually GR is telling you that you can't do this as long as you maintain the positivity conditions of energy. So that's one of the difficulties. But no, if you go back and ask somebody like Bob Ward or many GR people, what is their solution? They will say, yes, we want another universe in here that you can connect to another universe or just a bubble or you know, do this and open up to another universe. Once you have a neck like this, you have a lot of things you can do. So going back up uh, a bit uh, to this picture of the wormhole. Um, what's the how, what's the playbook for for the energetics um, in that sort of situation? It's a little further up. Uh, here you go. Yeah. So so if you say if you may, I think this is sort of uh, at least some talks I've seen about uh, islands end up with some sort of picture, which is, you know, I think probably goes back to the original ER equals EPR story, uh, right? Which is that, that somehow there's a wormhole connecting the interior to the, to the early radiation right. that wiggles the phases and ends up making something that's uh, not losing information. So that has to be somehow married with this remnant story, right? Because the black hole is uh, Planck size, yep. and you and you still haven't got the information out. Um, then, um, so, then you need you you, yeah. you need you need somehow to transfer information through the wormhole, but using very little energy. Uh, yeah, so, so they were trying a bit of a mixing up, maybe three different things. So maybe let me mention that and then take your question again. So here was the black hole and here are the emitted particles. They were talking about not even letting it go back to the Planck size. The black hole is not evaporating to Planck size. But when you have a C quantum here and a B quantum here, because they're entangled, they'll join them with the worm. Okay, so that was the end. So the black hole is not small yet. And we have the B and the C and we have joined them by a wormhole. And then there's some other B and some other C, let's say B2 and C2, so B1 and C1. So that's also joined by a wormhole. And then the idea was, well, here these guys are far away, but here all these wormholes are coming to a close by place. And so then all these wormholes join what they, what's called a squid diagram. 
and they do something. They do something and they change something, but how that helps anything, let's not get into that. So that was the first paper of Malthus and Suskind from 2013, that we draw these wormholes and then something happens because too many wormholes are coming here, but too many wormholes come here, to sort of join into a massive wormhole, whatever that might mean. And then that has these little branches and those little branches, the C's all merge into one and here are the B's. And once they've merged into one, the black hole has somehow changed, but we don't want to think about how it has changed. So that was the iteration number one. So here actually- so in, had, that, in that picture is the wormhole, are the wormholes supposed to be some kind of geometrization of the entanglement itself? So that's what I'm coming to now. So as I said, they have mixed up three different things here. So at that point, B and C was simply entangled. And then Juan said, the moment any two things are entangled, I can represent it by a wormhole. So represent just means that I'll draw a picture, but they are just ordinary entangled things. So I'll represent it by a wormhole. So now that's just a picture. So then even if you have a, nothing to do with a black hole, but just two electrons, which are entangled, you can represent it by a wormhole. As long as you do only that, it's easy to see you haven't actually changed the black hole problem because only a picture, unless something dynamical happens, it's not going to get your information out. So for a, for a year or two, it was just going on by saying you're representing it, but what that does, nobody was saying anything. Then came up these papers saying that, no, you can actually make the wormholes traversable because you can beat the right Chaudhary equation if you have locally negative energies and then you can make the wormhole traversable and something needs to get out. So that was a shift in the story, but as we can see, that's a different, now we're trying to put some dynamics on it because if you only represent it by that, the ER equals EPR, initial thing, that actually had no dynamics. They were simply saying if two things are entangled, represent them by a wormhole, but that doesn't do you any good because you can, it's just a word. You haven't added anything which will happen. But then people start saying that, no, you can make the wormhole traversable and uh, then things can get out, but they didn't actually show how things can get out. They just said wormholes can be traversable because that can be Cassegrain. So that's closer to what we were just talking about, how you would you know, need these necks and with Cassegrain to beat the ratio of the equation. But these were two different steps. And the third thing they mixed up with was neither of these was being applied to a tiny remnant. The idea was that even while the black hole was big, all the stuff, something was happening to it. So when you applied a B and a C, you don't wait for the C, the black hole to become small because then you already have all these puzzles. At the, at the end of evaporation, whatever you do, you'll be in trouble. Don't go there. Just after the halfway point, you can start imagining that the wormholes are traversable and the C is inside, sort of get out. Now, I don't know if anybody has concretely written this down, but the only way I can make sense of what they are saying, if they want the page curve to come down, is that before the black hole has gone away, just at the halfway point, somehow what happens is that there's a escalator working. So the seas which are inside, they start going out through the wormholes and they leak out uh, through these wormholes out to infinity. So the entire wormhole picture, unless you make the wormholes traversable and just at the halfway point or before you start making the interior guys leak out through the wormholes, unless you add these things, I can't make any sense of what they are saying with saying ER equals EPR. So, and, but then it sounds like in this picture, you're saying basically after the halfway point, the Hawking quanta are the C's rather than additional B's. So that's the other problem, right? You want the C's to come out because they're already the ones inside you're entangling with and creating a problem. But if you maintain a smooth horizon, actually more entangled pairs, let's say B, N plus one C, N plus one are being created. So somehow you have to stop this process and switch to a new process where the C's are coming out the older seeds are coming out. So you have really two jobs to do. You have to stop but then you're, But then you're back to this uh, so-called old black hole problem. That, yes. That, that an old black point. hole has, you know, it's, you're back to the firewall basically. Exactly. That an old black hole point. can't be, have no drama at the horizon. Absolutely. You, you need to have a non-smooth horizon after the halfway point. So if you're going to have the non-smooth horizon after the halfway point, why don't you have it right away after a few crossing times, the way I would think it would form, you know, if you can form something at the horizon, which will, which is like a solid ball, like a first ball, form it right in the beginning and read it like a piece of coal. Why go halfway, create a problem, then stop for the radiation by the, you know, by the first ball or whatever formation, and then try to drag the earlier quanta out by some wormhole. It doesn't make any sense. So I think one needs to press the island people for what they are saying. When do they stop the further pair from forming? And when do the older members come out? 
what is the part that the traversable wormhole story had to play in this role? And how can this the ER equals EPR as a formal entanglement with no dynamics? How can that help you at all? Are all very good questions to ask the island people. I have never gotten a good answer. So Samir, I have a, a bit more of a general question in what you're describing here. So as, as far as I understand it, if you hear any of these um, island proposals, one of the most striking thing is, is the claim that no quantum gravity is needed or very little of it is needed. And to the extent that you trust gravitational holography, that's all you need. And meaning that the resolution lies not at Planckian energies. So when you describe all these different scenarios which come from historical context, uh, everything at the end boils down to some high energy quantum gravity physics that needs to come in and save the day. So is, is, is your viewpoint or the general scheme that you're presenting that there is no way to resolve this paradox unless there is some sort of new physics at high energy that, that sort of tells us what quantum gravity is at the Planck scale. So indeed, I am absolutely saying that. And I think the important thing is that all these claims that by using 2D JT gravity, they have managed to show that the information comes out are just wrong. So I think that's what we were trying to understand in assignment four. We wanted to understand what on earth have these people done? Because they're simply using low energy, semi-classical gravity of 2D gravity, but there is really nothing. There's not even any string theory or anything. So what could they have done? And the point is when you go and read those papers, you actually find they haven't done anything. And the, what they have actually done, which Malzana is quite explicit about, but the other people don't even seem to realize that they haven't done anything. So what we went back in the fourth assignment and we learned was that there is an old Euclidean calculation. Right? In the Euclidean calculation, what happens is there is no black hole. If we just take T to I tau, you find what is called a cigar geometry. And then you compute the partition function of this and you deduce from that an entropy. Let's call it Gibbons Hawking, Gibbons Hawking entropy. And that's always a finite number because the Euclidean uh, entropy is, uh, is action is finite. And then the whole point is if you assume that this is the correct entropy, this is the actual entropy, then there is no puzzle. The puzzle actually is that when you actually go to the Lorentzian section, you can make on these long slices we made, you can make infinitely many states of quanta going up and down, up and down, the kind of states created by the Hawking radiation. So the Lorentzian section shows infinitely many states. Lorentzian has infinitely many states and the Euclidean gives a finite answer. So this has been known right from the Gibbons Hawking time in 1976. So the whole puzzle can be reformulated by saying, why does the Euclidean answer not agree with the Lorentzian answer? You can just say the saddle point doesn't work or what, or is the Lorentzian metric wrong? But the mismatch between these is a restatement of the puzzle. So what these people have done is that they have taken 2D gravity. This was done in three plus one gravity by Gibbons and Hawking, but you can do it also for 2D gravity, so done by CGHS and all in those days. And they've gone and reproduced the Gibbons Hawking or analogs of Gibbons Hawking. So I will tell you what the analog is, but let's first get the spirit and then I will tell you what the analog which they computed. So if you compute the Euclidean answer and say it is finite, and so I don't have any problem, then in fact, you haven't even started answering the question because the problem was the mismatch between the Euclidean and the Lorentzian. So then you ask them, did you ever talk about Lorentzian at all? And they will say, yes, we also looked at Lorentzian. So you go to these papers of Malzner and Metal, and they also talk about Lorentzian. And there they find that the entanglement is actually growing. So they have the B quanta, the C quanta, and the entanglement, the horizon is here and the time is actually growing and the page curve is not coming down. So then you say, well, isn't that what we told you? You do 2D gravity. 2D gravity was completely done at the whole quantum level by CGHS. You're getting back the old CGHS answer. So what have you done? And then they would say, no, but we have a prescription. And the prescription is that to define the entropy of the radiation, we don't only look at the B quanta, which we thought was radiation. The radiation is actually the B quanta union the C quanta. So this together is what you should call the radiation. And this you can see is not entangled with anything else near the end point of evaporation because the Bs are entangled with the Cs, but a set which is B union C, let's take the set of B, 
union the set of C, that's not entangled with anything. So if I change my definition of what is the radiation to the B union the C, then I don't have a problem. And then you scratch your head and say, but how can that be? The radiation is what is outside, the C is what is inside, and tangled between B and C was the problem. Why are you telling me the radiation is B union C? And then they say, no, we have two pictures. In the semi-classical picture, the uh, information doesn't come out because in semi-classical picture, you see the B is outside and the C is inside, but this picture is wrong. So you say, okay, the semi class picture is wrong, that's fine. Information hasn't come out. So what have you done? This is the only calculation you have done. They say, but our point is that semi-classical answers are always wrong, but we'll give you a prescription to how to change the semi-classical answers to get the right answer. So you say, okay, what's the prescription? And they say the prescription is that whenever something outside entangles something inside, you take the union of them, and the, the union of them is what you should think of as the actual radiation in the actual quantum theory. So then you said, but you haven't proved, how do you prove that B union C in semi-classical is the actual B of the full quantum theory? And when you see how they prove that, there's actually no proof. To prove that, they say, well, they go back to their uh, Euclidean answer and they draw their uh, Ruth Takanagi surfaces and so on, which are all analogs of this Newton Gibbons Hawking, and they say, that works. So, what do you mean by saying it works? So, what works is that if you take the Gibbons Hawking kind of minimal surfaces, it gives you an entropy which doesn't go up. Well, that's by definition, because we knew from the beginning the Gibbons Hawking answers never go up. The Euclidean answers never give infinity because in the Euclidean section, there is no interior to the black hole. So when you go back to the proof, you find they actually appeal to Ruth Akanagi, which is actually the analog of Gibbons Hawking in the case where there isn't even a black hole. So there's no black hole. They have some, they use some Ruth Akanagi surfaces there. If you had a black hole, the Ruth Akanagi surface becomes the analog of the Gibbons Hawking calculation. But they say because in there the entropy comes down, that quote unquote works. For them, in the Lorentzian, that means that whenever something is not working, just go ahead, take the union, and then it will work. But you say, you haven't told me anything at any stage. And this, so this is the prescription. If you don't believe the prescription, well, you're sort of having a little bit of a problem, but this is the prescription. And you so, dig around and around into this, you'll find there's nothing there. So is it fair to say then that if you accept Ryu Takanayagi and its generalization as a given, without proof as a principle, yes. then the island approach is a resolution of the paradox. No, because they're not even addressing the paradox. The Ruta Kanagi is exactly equivalent to saying that the entropy of something is given by the Gibbons Hawking answer. The paradox was that the Gibbons Hawking answer is not equal to the actual number of states. They still have the same problem. They're not even addressing the problem. Maybe putting it another way, I mean, did Gibbons and Hawking answer the paradox 40 years ago with the Gibbons Hawking instant on? The answer is no, it's just a saddle point calculation that produces the right answer. Yeah. It doesn't tell you anything about the dynamics of formation of yeah. Hawking radiation. Like Gibbons, Hawking, Gibbons and Hawking maybe just concretize the paradox because they said, here's a way of getting the answer. Here's the actual number of states. Why are they not matching? So that's why we went in assignment four through all the different derivations of entropy, which say that the temperature T comes out of the calculation of Hawking radiation. If you assume thermodynamics was correct and you write TDS equals DE, it gives you S equal to a finite number, A by four. We went to this calculation. So if you assume it's a normal body, there's no paradox. So what is the paradox? The paradox is always the construction of the infinitely many states. So until you come to this actual picture where you draw this good slice and you see the states, you're not even touching the paradox. So you have to see at which stage are these people coming to that. And when they reach this, they say, we agree that the island is entangled with the outside. We cannot fix that. And so the only way we'll fix that is when we come to the actual paradox, we'll say, instead of looking at the radiation outside, consider B union C, and that's the correct way to think about radiation. Now you can say, can you pinpoint that that is the wrong answer? And the thing is, yes, there's a mistake in saying you can take B union C, and the mistake in that is that if you have, have quantized infinity, you can't actually play games with them. At infinity, there is no semi-classical approximate and exact. There's no difference between them. Because at infinity, you can take the quanta, pass them through a stronger like and find out if it is entangled or pure. So the trouble these people really have is that at the end, when you say when they say that 
B union C is the correct way to think of B semi-classical, union C semi-classical, that is equal to B exact. And so say, they say that because B uni semi-classical, union C semi-classical, B semi-classical, union C semi-classical is equal to B exact. That's what they would like to say. That B and C, B semi-classical, they can't fix it. All their GT gravity is only the normal semi-classical. It's just CGHS, and they are entangled. Then they will tell you, I want to take B semi-classical, use C semi-classical, and that's not entangled with anything. Say, okay. But they want to prove the radiation is not entangled with anything. So they will say, this is true. But this can't be true because near infinity, the semi-classical is actually equal to exact. If you make small corrections to that, it doesn't help you because the small correction here. So at infinity, you, can, you have a quantum in your hand. You can pass it through a stern garlack and you can check if it is entangled or not entangled. We went through that about how you would check it, right? By, if you have a spin, how do you check it is entangled or not? So the problem is that at the end, when they try to sell you this story, that story means only one thing, that the quanta which has come out of the black hole for which this relation is going to be applied, are not like the quanta which have come out from a piece of coal. For a piece of coal, you pass them through a stronger lac, you can check that they are pure. If you take the same quanta which you have coming out from the black hole, you pass them through a stronger lac, you'll find they are mixed. And Malusina is very upfront about it. He says that if he takes these B quanta which have come out of a black hole and he does some complicated experiment on them, he can actually modify what is sitting in the rem. You must have seen him say this at many times, but you have to like, you know, ask about this, then he will bring this up, that if these quanta come from a black hole, this is where the non-locality is. You can manipulate this B quanta in such a way that you can actually affect the C quanta in here, even though they are nowhere close to each other. And this is where I think the essential point is of the whole island game. Everything else is just words. There is no calculation anywhere. In the end, there's just a claim for what they think the picture is. And they think the picture is that if you take this B quanta in the end, the black hole is different from a piece of coal because you can do crazy things with the B quanta just far away in your lab and you can actually twiddle what is sitting inside the rabbit. While if this quanta came out from a piece of coal, uh, the coal is gone, you do whatever you want. There's nothing to twiddle there anyway. I mean, there's nothing in the, if there's a tiny piece of coal left, you can't influence that. So, I, yeah, yeah I, actually, I, oh, go ahead. I, I think, I think, uh, to me, the bottom line, I, I totally agree that what's happening here is a, a redefinition of the problem or uh, maybe a redefinition of the solution. But, but I think the suggestion, if, if I am to play devil's advocate here, the suggestion may be that space-time itself is not a fundamental concept, entanglement, quantum entanglement is the fundamental concept and you use entanglement to define to define what you mean by uh, what you see in space time as a measured entanglement or whatever meaning that they're redefining the notion of entanglement uh, as computed in gravity by the quantum side meaning that this is our definition of what would be a measurable quantity for entanglement and it overrides anything that traditional semi-classical gravity would tell you as entanglement. I think, so I, think that's, I think that's exactly the kind of words that are coming out of a lot of the island group. But I think that has led into a confusion which we must be very clear, uh, which is very important to clarify. You can define a lot of things at lots of places, right? And they are welcome to make their definitions. The problem with the black hole game is that at the end, there is a certain experiment and we have to ask them what is their result of that experiment and the experiment is this you just make a black hole of mass 100 black mass in CERN you let it evaporate and then you take these 100 quanta that you get at the end b1 to bn and then you pass them through a stern girl lag and you ask are they going to show up as pure or as entangled and let's recall what a stern girl lag check was if you have a single spin and you want to check if it is pure or entangled if it was, let's say, in a state like up plus down, then uh, if you measure sigma z, 50% of the time it will be up, 50% of the time it will be down. But if you measured sigma x, then it will always give you up. Right? It will never give you down. Well, if it was actually an entangled guy, like up times something down, 
plus downtime something up. Then whichever direction you measure it, the uh, the spin, so put them, let's make let's make the singlet. Whichever direction you put the sternal lag, you'll always find 50-50, right? So this was the this is a very definite experiment. You have the quanta in your hand, which have come out of a little black hole of 100 black masses you made at CERN. You pass them through 100 sternal lag sitting over there, and you check by doing this repeatedly, making the same way evaporating, same way evaporating it. You check if with some addition of sternal lag, you always hit 100 zero, or you always get 50-50. There is no doubt that we can measure what entanglement is just looking at the B quanta. So now you ask them, we are just asking what they claim experimentally. They make this black hole of 100 Planck mass at CERN by colliding two protons at energy of 100 Planck mass total. They wait for the 100 quanta to come out. They correct them in stern lax at leisure in their lab, everything low energy. They measure their entanglement and they do this 100 times repeated identically. Are they getting the answer that they are pure or they are intact? At this point, the question is so sharp and so precise that any definition they are making will be completely exposed. And the point is, with whatever they are claiming, that I will have some semi-classical picture where the JT gravity holds to some approximation. With all that, at the end, what they will find is these quanta outside pass through a stronger lag will be an entangled state. So the, the small correction theorem will not leave you a choice. So there's an actual difference in the answer. At that point, they can say, we still want to say that this is what we want to call pure, fine, but the answer is different from the answer you're getting from first balls. Because in first balls, you would say, it burnt like a piece of coal. There was no semi classical approximation for this quanta at the horizon. You pass them through a stern girl lag with an appropriate orientation of the 100 stern girl lags. This is going to be pure. Every time you'll get, get the same spin. And with them, it will not be pure. And I think the problem is that many of the island people don't understand this. So they have got into their definition and saying that by some definition, it's okay, I have solved it. But they don't come back to the point where they realize that at infinity, everything can be measured. And they're either going to get into a mess by saying that quanta photons coming out of a black hole are different from photons coming out from the core. Like the ones coming out of the black hole you know, can remotely influence other things. The ones coming from the core can't. Either they are two different kinds of photons at infinity, which are never seen in string theory, or they have to say there are non-local effects also, which, you know, again, that requires different kinds of photons because there's only one kind of particle at infinity, or they actually haven't said anything. So you really have to put them down to the experiment and say, what are you going to say when I make a 100 blank mass black hole at certain evaporator? And are, everything else is just definitions. When dashed washed out, this is their problem. Emil, did you want to follow up with? Yeah, so... Um... I mean, this idea that the that the island is part of the radiation, um, I, I think um, I've heard varying stories about what that means. Um, so um, so I mean, taken literally, it makes it sound like uh, there's something very weird going on, right? Namely, that in a in a in a gas of almost free photons, um, uh, as you say, there are sort of two different kinds. Uh, you know, some very low energy photons that are somehow making up some island, and uh, some ordinary photons which you've collected during the process of Hawking radiation, and and uh, um, they're not very specific about what they mean by the island is part of the radiation. I mean, um, you know, when I think of a, of a, you know, dumping some Hawking photons into a, you know, say, you know, this room, um, uh, you know, I think of constructing the Hilbert space in this room and asking, you know, what quanta there are um, in that Hilbert space and, and, okay, you can entangle them whatever way you want. Um, uh, but somehow you've used the degrees of freedom in this room to construct the island. Uh, and, and, you know, then I could understand what they mean by, you know, manipulating entangled pairs, manipulating the photon, the ordinary photons and somehow um, mucking with the, the island photons. Um, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is that uh, during the evaporation process, there are these wormholes created. I'm not saying I espouse this, but, but one could entertain the possibility 
that uh, there are these wormholes that are connecting the bees and the seas. And you know, as the evaporation process is going on, you are somehow transferring entanglement from the interior to the outside by some non-local process. Uh, and um, and so, so that, would, that would be a way of restoring the purity of the B quanta, but by some process which is extremely non-local um, and has to have some energetics, um, which is why I was asking the question before about um, the transfer through wormholes and what's the energetics of that. But I mean, uh, sort of implicit in the small corrections theorem is some statement about the B quanta when they get sufficiently far away, they're really not interacting with anything anymore and you can just treat them on their own. That's right. And, and so if you say there's always can, some kind of wormhole connecting them to the island, then you're sort of saying, well, maybe that's not the case, that maybe Absolutely. these photons or these radiation B quanta are always interacting with the island. And uh, that's the way they transfer their entanglement uh, and restore purity of the radiation at late stages. I agree hundred percent. That's what, if you boil all the nonsense away, that's what you're left with. That with fuzzballs are like paper, but something leaves no, 2M, 100M, some distance, it's gone, it's gone, right? Doesn't touch anymore. That's how coal burns also. If a photon comes out, it's gone, right? Doesn't really get bothered by the coal again. These guys, what they need is that even though the photons get very far, they're still somehow connected back to the seas. Other, either the seas are keeping on twisting their spins even as they get further and further out at all distances, or if you do something to the seas, you can twist the bees, something to the bees, you can twist the seas. You need a non-local interaction. And that's very funny because normally when you get far away to flat space, we thought that we knew all the excitations of string theory there, where you know you just quantize string theory, you just get ordinary gravitons, photons, you know, this multiple of 256 massless particles. And now you need two different kinds of photons, the ones that came out of coal and the ones that came out of black hole. Because the ones that came out of coal presumably are not really being influenced by somebody else. Somebody far away can't like twiddle something and make the spin of this guy jump. But the ones that came out of a black hole they are secretly connected to this wormhole. So you know, if you twiddle the wormhole, uh, this can jump. And there's nothing wrong with that. That just means the space-time in the, as you just said, I'm not trying to repeat what you just said, but when a black hole evaporates, then the particles that come out, the whole space-time manifold has gotten completely corrupted. It's not just flat space on which particles are moving, it's flat space, but connected by wormholes and these particles are moving, but they are connected like this. So I'm starting to sort of, just repeat what you said, that there are pictures that when something comes out of a black hole, it's like this. When something comes out of coal, it's just this. So there's really two different things you do at infinity. And uh, if you ball away all the nonsense about redefinition, this is equal to this, this is class seven, class seven and all, there has to be a difference like this. And otherwise they haven't said anything. So, uh, there's something that's really bugging me at this point. You know, it's the issue of this whole business of wormholes. There's a level at which this is physics by word processor. You go through a book, a book on quantum information, and every time you see the appearance of the word entanglement, you replace it by the words wormhole. And it has no content. Yes. But somehow, and, 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 and then, there's the, then there is something about a non-local interaction and a non-local modification of quantum field theory. And so if you add a wormhole, you don't add wormhole. That is just words at this point without dynamics of the wormhole. But the broader point I want to say is, it sounds like there are two species of photons. There's yes. the one that interacts locally, and there's the one that interacts non-locally. Yes. And that's all that's, that, and that's presumably a testable hypothesis. Decorating it with the word wormhole is absolutely meaningless at this point until you've actually formed a dynamics of wormholes. So do we have two species of photons, or does we have one species of photon which have all sorts of non-local interactions with everybody else in the universe? Or what, what's the hypothesis here? So that's exactly the question. What you just said is exactly what I was also trying to say, which is uh, that, which, which is what Emil also said, that yes, they, they, they are forced, whether they say it explicitly or not, they are forced exactly to this situation, that quanta which have photons are in two different species, those which have come out of black holes, the space-time also has torn its structure and gotten a different structure where there are other pieces of space-time linking you, which are not just words, but they actually can do something. Otherwise, there's nothing, you know, can't solve the problem. There are these actual links to these guys and the ones coming out of coal, they are, they are just like, they don't have these, these links. The space-time has not gotten these extra tubes coming out of it. And they really are two species, exactly. 
I think Stan had his hand up for a bit. Sorry, so, so that's what I said. Okay. I'd, like, I'd like to come to, to continue on this issue a bit, maybe, uh, in the sense that I'm just wondering whether the, indeed, the difference between the photons that are emitted by a lump of coal and the photons that, and, and the photons that are emitted by Hawking radiation, the, their fundamental difference is that the lump of coal doesn't modify the space-time geometry around it. It's Minkowski space-time for all intents and purposes. Whereas the, so the photons that are emitted by a lump of coal are propagating in a Minkowski background. Whereas the photons that are emitted, where the, whereas the Hawking quanta that are emitted by a black hole, in fact, are not uh, propagating in Minkowski space-time. They're propagating the black hole space-time and as they are propagating, it's precisely the, the non-trivial problem is that the space-time is time-dependent, is the geometry is changing, and, and how fast it's changing is the is the issue. So where does so is it true that one can say that the talking about wormholes, I don't know whether it can become mathematically precise, is a way of trying to get a handle on a, math, on a mathematical description. Of how the space-time geometry is changing by the emission of Hawking quanta, I mean, that is a difference with the lump of coal. So something of that is what these people are trying to do. The problem is the issue of scales. We know that geometry is very time-dependent in some region, let's say up to 2m, maybe 3m, 4m. Okay, so whatever something is happening here, and we can give them anything. We don't know how a black hole might do it, so let's say they can do anything they want. The problem is these particles have now moved very far. They are like millions of miles from the black hole. Whatever they want to happen, whatever they do here can't help them because that's all included in the, you know, in, in the game that we, we all work with. The the first ball or whatever. They have the, they are saying exactly what you, I think you also just said. When particles emit from the black hole, they create this extra little tear in the space time, which is uh, actual geometric wormhole. And that guy then persists, even though the particles have gone far. And so what Nick was also saying right now is that at near infinity, if you look at these particles, now there is no time dependence or anything funny going on. These particles have come to my room. I could have made this black hole insert, and these have now been collected into the detector, which is near the office, which people are sitting in insert. And there you're trying to analyze these particles, which you have collected in a box. You brought them to the other lab with ordinary standard like experiments, and you are doing it there. And these guys still carry these tails attached to them. And they are not like the particles which came out of a piece of coal, which were you know, just ordinary particles without these space-time tubes attached to them. And so the, whatever you, somebody might have said in this region, black hole is violent, it has non-trivial gravity, coal doesn't have much gravity, is all true. The problem is the Hawking problem didn't even care how the black hole is emitting it, right? It was always such a robust problem. The question, these guys are changing what particles behave like at infinity. Some guys have tubes attached to them and some guys don't. And the question is, they are actually going to be forced to this, otherwise they have said nothing. And if they are forced to this, do we believe it? Okay, so, or does anybody believe it? So that's their choice. But this is what they are forced to. I, I noticed that Wei Xiang said his hand up for some time. So can we bring him into the conversation? Or, uh... Oh, yes. Th thank you. So, um, yeah, so may I ask a question about the, um, the, 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 the entropy that you just discussed about the Hawking quanta at far away at asymptotic infinity, then you're saying that basically there's only one entanglement entropy, one well-defined fine-grained entanglement entropy for those Hawking quanta. Then may I ask what, because the, in the island proposals, they have, they, as you said, they have used a, a Gibbons Hawking type com computation to try to give a justification of the island formula. Then if, if the Hawking quanta far away is really, as you said, the entanglement entropy is just the, the, the original thermal entropy that Hawking calculated, then how, how, how do we interpret this, the so-called quote-unquote entropy that they derived using the, uh, the replica trick? What, how, how, what then, is that really an entropy or is this, is, is this just no meaning at all? Their derivation of that von Neumann entropy of radiation. So it has no meaning in the sense that it's the same as the Gibbons Hawking calculation, right? A Gibbons Hawking calculation, what it does is it computes the action of something, right? And once you compute the action of something, 
then you say that if I compute the action of a normal system, I take a normal system, let's say a piece of coal, this coal, let's say, and I put in a one loop path integral of imaginary time uh, beta, then what, what happens is if you do the path integral over a one loop path like this, you get a summation over states e to the minus beta times the energy of the states, right? Then from this, if you just do ordinary ma manipulations, you can get an entropy. So this is just stat back, right? If you do the same thing for gravity and you assume some kind of saddle point, you get the Gibbons Hawking answer. Let's call that S Gibbons Hawking. Up to here, you just follow your nose. You don't know what's happening in gravity, but you know that something similar works in stat back. So you do it for gravity and you get a finite answer. The problem all comes after that, but they are just doing this answer, the analog of this answer. But the puzzle came after because this answer doesn't tell you anything about the actual entanglement entropy. This is just a number. It doesn't tell you anything about any entanglement or the or what is entangling with what. The Hawking paradox has to do with the fact that when the black hole is emitting something, it's emitting it by pair creation, not by coming out from a surface, and that's generating entanglement. And then it's all in the Lorentzian picture. In the Euclidean picture, you don't even see the inside of the horizon. So if you want to address the information paradox, you have to go and see that the Gibbons Hawking calculation is not the calculation you'd get in the Lorentzian picture. So if you ask me what have they computed, they have computed the analog of this guy. Okay. So you can compute this guy and give me back the Gibbons Hawking answer. And if somebody were to say Gibbons Hawking answer is finite, so I don't have a problem, then you never had a problem. But that's of course wrong. Because okay. They've got an extra term though. So they have these wormholes, they have the Gibbons Hawking, they say, oh, there's another saddle point and it becomes dominant at some other point. So what the hell does that mean? So what they're doing there is the following. So that's the Ryu Takanagi kind of story. So what happens is when you compute, uh, so actually if you go back and see how the saddle point actually jumps from one to the other, you find there's a problem with that calculation because how do they actually put in the fact that you are putting in some large number N of entangled quanta. So the idea initially was you have a large number of entangled quanta and when you have a large number of entangled quanta, the saddle point jumps. Actually, if you look at the calculation, it doesn't jump, okay? There's some problem there with the calculation. So let's go back and dig into the problem. So the people who try to do this properly to show that if there are lots of entangled quanta, the saddle point will jump. That's the paper of Douglas, Schenker, Pennington, there are some four authors on that paper, right? So what they try to do is, they try to do the 2D gravity calculation. They try to do the 2D gravity calculation, putting in what's called an end of the world brain. So they call it EOW brain, where you have 2D gravity, and then at some inside point, which is the boundary of space, you put in an end of W brain, which carries a spin I, which can take values one to N. Okay, so you're doing something which represents the fact that you have lots of flavors or quanta inside. And they say, when I look, when I have a lot of flavors, I'm actually going to go and get a different answer. Okay, so then they say, I'll change the saddle. And then you go and look at the calculation, do they actually get a change of saddle? And you find something very funny. Right from the beginning, you find that if you actually have a normal theory of gravity, you cannot get a change of saddle. So they say right in their first section, actually the second section after the introduction, they will say that this requires the theory of gravity to actually be an ensemble theory before you even start. So if you have something which is not an ensemble theory, which has pure uh, states like string theory, this doesn't even pertain to that. Okay, so that's the first thing to notice when you actually try to see that the saddle point actually jumps, the first requirement is it only works for an ensemble theory and it doesn't work for a pure theory because if it was a pure theory, you can already show there's a contradiction with this idea of large and changing saddle point. They themselves show the contradiction. Okay, then let's assume it's an ensemble theory and let's go on with what they find. And what they find in the end is that the entanglement of this quanta will actually increase, not come down. So they have the C quanta and the B quanta, the Cs and this is the Bs. And then they are saying that if you actually try to do this measurement using the stern girl like apparatus that I was talking about, then this process of measurement of the, so I'm making some big stern girl like apparatus to measure this, right? They're saying this process of measuring it will create another black hole or something like a black hole. And that process will actually go and influence these quanta. This is what they write in section three under the section called PETS map light. So you really have to understand where we have gone with all this. 
this fa the fact what they are saying is we take the quanta coming out of a black hole the physics they are getting out of it first they need an ensemble theory otherwise the mathematics doesn't work anyway and then if you take this quanta and you try to analyze them by historical like the way i was saying if you get 100 quanta at CERN, you can take them to the lab you can give it to 100 different guys the apparatus can be very far away and you analyze them they're saying no when i analyze them this ensemble theory is telling them that in analyzing them the process of analyzing them will go back and influence will interact with these c quanta which i had so in the so there's an interaction between the quanta i created and the effect of actually trying to measure them so they call this the quantum computer which tries to create the measurement that actually the process of measuring it interferes with the quanta which were actually inside the hole it's absolutely a completely bizarre but this is the kind of non local thing that we were talking about that fiddling with the bees how that influenced the guy inside we were talking about that fact you can see it very explicitly because they write a beautiful toy model under the section 3 called pets map light and just go read that don't read the rest of the pets map just pets map light and you see this is what they are saying it's all the non local physics written so, more so, explicitly but also needs the ensemble theory then i say say that just was like it's not true that if you simply have a lot of radiation the saddle point flips that's a story that many people have you know you know gathered from the words but it's not like there was something wrong with the Gibbons Hawking calculation and then, or with the Hawking calculation, you do it carefully, the side point flips and solve the problem. There's nothing like that. Well, I, I think, this? Samir, I think, I think the bottom line for me is that, is that, is, is the claim that what is observable as entanglement entropy is being redefined. It's being redefined as a quantity that is inspired from Ru Takayanagi and Gibbons Hawking. So, so the, the question is really like, if you accept that definition, that sort of, it's the emergent space-time paradigm, right? That space-time is really approximate. All these conclusions that we draw from the space-time calculation are not to be reliable. And there is a description of the degrees of freedom and its entanglement that needs to be redefined as the observable entropy. So if you accept that as a definition, then you say, okay, there is no problem as you're saying. The problem at the essence that, that I'm having is that none of this is pointing out where the Hawking calculation fails. So, so if there is a new definition of what should be observable entanglement, then, that definition should tell us why is it that what you are proposing to be measured at infinity through a stern gerlach experiment, why is that not measuring the physical uh, observable instead? So, so I would like to, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'll let you, you yeah, go ahead and finish. So this is the kind of story they have tried to sell, but this story is wrong. So that's why I wanted to jump in here. Some part of the people are, have been selling the story that because quantum gravity is very delicate, once the radiation has come out, you don't quite know what you are measuring. You could try to measure something semi-classically. There's a more detailed thing which you could measure quantum gravitationally. And there's one fine-grained entropy. There's a thermodynamic entropy. There are many kinds of entropy. Who knows what we should really measure? This is actually all nonsense. Once you actually have 100 quanta in your hand, which have come from a 100 Planck mass black hole, there is only one thing you can measure. You pass them to a stronger lag. There's one answer you will get. Any small corrections to that, there can always be small quantum gravity corrections to anything. They will not affect your answer. That's the small correction theorem. So it's not that some delicate thing can be hiding in the fact that semi-classical is the different from exact quantum gravity at infinity. It's this, that the stronger lag experiments measure semi-classical or measures exact. There are no two things hiding in there. So let me just make that as a statement, then we can talk about it. But somehow they have tried to create an impression, some of the people that because quantum gravity is so delicate, there's somehow another entropy inside particles, which we can try to define, which is not actually what we normally mean when we measure in the lab or something like that. I would like to emphatically say that's not true. If you try to make that claim, it's actually equal to saying that in my lab, I'll have two species of particles, like we were saying 10 minutes ago, one which came out of black holes and have these tails attached to them and one not, I'll pass them to an ordinary Sterngirl lag, give it to an undergrad student and you will see the difference immediately. It's not like it's something delicate or this or that. 
In one case, you'll see 50, 0, 50, 100, 0. In one case, you'll see 50, 50 in the standard lag. It's not a question that something delicate is hiding in the true definition of entropy. So let me, I'm just making it as a statement right now. But I agree with you that that's what they were trying to sell. But go back and ask what will happen when you pass it through a Sternger lag. Sternger lag is a real apparatus. If there's any quantum gravity, it's also acting there. Right? There's no two different measurements you can make in the lab. Quantum gravity is always there. If it is small, it's small. If it's big, it's big. But there's only one measurement what happens with, with, in the Sternger lag. And small correction to the state can always be there. For psi, that is psi plus delta psi. That makes no difference to the answer. You're getting 100, 0 versus 50, 50. That's the problem right now of the entanglement that we are getting. If it changes to 99, 1, it's not going to help you, right? The fact is, it's 50, 50, and small crack only change to 49, 51. It's not going to become 100, 0. So you're absolutely right. This is the idea that they are giving. But this idea has no bearing. You go to infinity and you ask, what are these two kinds of entropy? And push them on that, and you find no answer. Stam, I think you want to ask a question. Uh, yes. Uh, regarding, I'd like to come back to the uh, back to the drawing you made just uh, just above, if you could. Yeah, right. And I was just wondering because precisely my, my question is, isn't the fact isn't the statement that you make you do your stern gerla on the on the bees uh, on the on the entanglement between the bees and the cities in the in the right side of your diagram, and then you say that. It, it'll feed back to the seas there, but isn't this feedback contingent on the on the coherence, just to name another buzzword from quantum computing, being uh, negligible, whereas it may not be? So it's not a question of decoherence because right now these things are not close to each other and you actually need a physical interaction because one of the things we had learned from one of the problems in the third problem set was if two systems are far from each other, any unitary evolution of one system doesn't change their entanglement. You can separately churn this system, separately churn this system. It doesn't change the entanglement between them. If you want the entanglement between them to change, something has to physically interact between them. And so this is the space spacetime geometry that changes as Hawking quanta uh, propagate. So you can do that, right? So, but the quanta which have propagated and left far away, if you still say that they, the quanta inside the black hole C and the quanta which are far away B, if you allow that the space-time geometry, even though they are very far away, can actually interact between them, you can change the entanglement. And I'm agreeing with you and with everybody else who said that the entire wormhole proposals, to the extent it is not trivial, if you throw away all the triviality away, is saying exactly this. It's saying that far away quanta here and far away from the black hole over here, other space-time threads are actually physically going, not just as words, physically, space-time threads are object. actually interacting. Huh? Go ahead. No, because I was just thinking, suppose that we were doing the same thing in any quantum field theory, say quantum electrodynamics, and you had photons coming in, photons coming out, and you had a scattering experiment between electrons and photons, you would have, it's the fact that in quantum electrodynamics, we do know the photon and the electron propagator and arbitrary backgrounds, whereas here we do not know the graviton propagator and arbitrary backgrounds that is the real problem. Uh, wouldn't that be correct? No, so the point of Hawking and also of Malvasina is that they do know the propagator, but if they assume a smooth horizon, which Malvasina also wants, then he's going to get the pair creation by exactly that propagator. So the actual creation of pairs can be written as this following Feynman diagram. You have one vertex, which is a gravitational field. So a metric perturbation H giving rise to B and C. This is the actual vertex of Hawking creation, of pair creation. It's the same as the vertex that you get if you have a charged source and you actually create, so the, the vertex which creates pairs of particles from an uh, external electric field. It, it has the same vertex. So writing in terms of Feynman diagrams, the calculation of Hawking mm -hmm. is saying you do know the Feynman diagram. If you had a smooth horizon there, you do know the Feynman diagram, and this creates the pair. This guy goes out, this guy goes in, like in scattering, the guys separate, and they don't touch each other anymore. So the problem is that they do know that. And the way the first ball gets out of it is that they say, 
this is not the correct Feynman diagram because the black hole is not smooth. It is something else, like a piece of coal. But okay. as long as you assume that your horizon is smooth, if you want the smooth horizon, then you do know the Feynman diagram because the metric here is creating the B and the C. And you can actually write this calculation in terms of an H coming from this source. So is it correct to say that at, the, at essentially at sub-Planck distances from the horizon, the correct statement should be that the horizon in fact is not smooth? So it doesn't have much to do with sub-Planck because you can write this Feynman diagram of particle creation entirely in terms of low energy modes because the state was the vacuum. If you look at all, all modes from one centimeter up to three kilometers, it was the vacuum at the one centimeter scale. The diagram which is coming here, the metric which you are putting in as the input has a scale of about a kilometer. That's the scale of variation of the metric, the time dependent metric. That's the scale carried by this propagator H and that's the scale of these quanta. So indeed, but apart from that Planck scale thing, if I remove that from what you said, that's exactly right. You have this particular Feynman diagram. Malsara wants this Feynman diagram. Then these two particles separate and they are entangled. That's also a Feynman diagram calculation. You can see that they are created in an entangled state from this Feynman diagram calculation. And then these two particles are separated. And then Malsara wants this not to be the answer of the final scattering. He wants the scattered particles to re-interact by some new space-time thread, a thin wormhole thread between them to actually change their spins after they have left the interaction zone. And that's a very hard thing to do. But that's the new physics they're claiming. In the interest of you know, wrapping this up in five that time, Samir, do you have more things you wanted to say um, or should we just let the discussion go? And the, also Andrea at the beginning threw a question in the chat. She can't be here. So I wanted to go to that at some point. Yeah, no, Samir, I think, yeah, I don't think I had anything extra to add. I think the discussion has been great because everything I want to say is on my mind over it, uh, I think uh, has been said. So I'm good. Yeah, let's go to Andrea's question, if you like. Um, it's in the chat. I just I was just looking at it again. Uh, hopefully, Samir will explain the apparent clash between the holography-based arguments that quantum gravity is non-local, with his approach of demanding locality at the up to the horizon, so that strong outside relativity leads to the contradiction between unitarity and a smooth horizon. So okay, there's a claim. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let us talk about it. So you can still see the iPad, right? Yep. Let me just clear the screen. There's too much mess here. So yeah, I think what has happened is very important. I wanted to, did want to talk about this. I think the reason that Malzina has gone wrong in all this is the following. I think it took the long, wrong lesson from ADS-CFT. So in ADS-CFT, what we have learned is that if you want the entanglement of some region in the boundary, this is global ADS I'm drawing here. If you want the entanglement of some region of the boundary, let's call it A, with the rest of it, which is a complement. Then the Ruth Akanagi formula told him that if you take the length of this arc here, in the bulk, then the length of this arc or the area of this arc divided by 4G gives this entanglement of this with this. That's the only input. Okay, so that's what's driving this whole thing. But there's no black hole here or anything. There are no entangled pairs of real excitations. It's just the entanglement in the vacuum state. So you put the CFT in a vacuum. The CFT at the boundary is in a vacuum. So there's a CFT and it's the CFT vacuum. Then you look at the entanglement of one piece of that boundary with the remaining piece of the boundary. You call this set A, you call this set A compl uh, co uh, complement and the entanglement of A with A complement in the vacuum state is given by the area A. I'm sorry, the area has nothing to do with the set A upon 4G. Okay. So that's the Ryutakanagi thing. Now this itself is the starting point and the only point in the data that Malzasena has. And he wants to go all the way from here to the fact that if he has a black hole and if he has real particles being produced, which are not in the vacuum, the actual excitations, their entanglement at arbitrary distances will somehow be given by areas and then that will solve his puzzle. Okay, so this is the, uh, the chain of thought that is going on in this entire story. But what is happening in the ADS is that there's actually Hamiltonians everywhere. So when you make the ground state of the boundary theory, then there are interactions between all these points. And if you have interactions between two points, like suppose you have a bunch of Ising spins and you have interactions between them, then you get correlations between them. Right? So you get a spins are entangled with the neighboring spin. If this is up, there's a good chance the next guy is up because the Hamiltonian between them favors aligned spins. Okay. So we know that Hamiltonians lead to entanglement. 
And that's for obvious reason. We did this example in our problem set where we took two coupled harmonic oscillators. And if we coupled two harmonic oscillators, then the ground state was actually an entangled one, right? And the ground state was 0, 0, plus 1, 1. The ground state was not a factorized state. So that's true. Whenever you make even two harmonic oscillators interact and you go look for the ground state, it will be entangled. That's exactly what is happening in this ADS safety example. The safety points are all talking to each other. So if you look at one subset in the ground state, again, we've taken the ground state, then these guys will be entangled with these guys. I can always take an excited state, but there's no entanglement, right? Because I could take states of two harmonic oscillators, even if they are coupled, I could look at a factorized state, vacuum of this times vacuum of this, that's factorized, but it's not the ground state. The ground state makes them want to correlate. Okay, so that's all that is, that's happening here. If you take the ground state of coupled harmonic oscillators, that's all they're looking at. And in a dual description, you can see that's given by the area. That's the only input. And so you can see there's no black holes here, nothing. But whatever entanglement is coming here is coming because of the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian in the bulk, Hamiltonian in the boundary, whichever one you want. Here's the Hamiltonian in the boundary because the entanglement is for something in the boundary. Now, Malsana turns this around and says, whenever there's entanglement, that is important. I don't need Hamiltonians. So if two particles are very far away, an electron is here, an electron is at Mars, and they are in an up, down, minus, down, up state, but this is in Earth, and this is in Mars, and they are entangled. He says he still wants to use the ideas he got from ADS CFT to talk about it. And somewhere there will be areas, there will be, you know, this entanglement will be important, and new effects will come. But the fact is, nothing new will come because this time there's no Hamiltonian between them. So Hamilton need to lead to entanglement, but Malsana wants to turn this around and say that entanglement gives the same kind of dynamics that you get from Hamiltonians. And that I think is just false because you can take two different harmonic oscillators very far from each other. You can put them in an entangled state, right? You can have one oscillator, I can have another. I put in an entangled state. That doesn't mean that I can do something to my oscillator and affect your oscillator. But that's exactly what Malzina is trying to do. He's saying that if two oscillators are entangled, if there's one oscillator here, one oscillator here, very far away, no spring connecting them, but they're in a state 0, 0, plus 1, 1. Then if I do something to this oscillator, I can actually influence this oscillator. But I think that's not true because the other way around was true. If two oscillators are connected by a Hamiltonian, then the ground state of that is entangled. But that's because of the Hamiltonian. It is not because of the entanglement. Okay. So this, this was the essential thing. And what has happened to, let me just go back and read the question. And so the holography arguments are simply saying that while they are in ADS, because it's a bounded region, there are Hamiltonians everywhere. There you can see the interaction between the point, right? And so nothing from this should be ported over to the story where we have one remnant over here and the radiation over here, which is just like this situation, two very far away spins entangled with each other. To this, if we try to apply the story, which came from two coupled guys, it actually has no meaning. So I was, I'm glad somebody asked this question because this is, I think this is the root of all the problem. Uh, you're trying to port away the idea of entanglement actually getting Hamiltonians or effective interactions, but I think that's just not true. So does that mean anything to anybody in the context of what this question is? Or maybe I didn't understand the question? I think much depends on what Andrea meant by the non-locality implicit in, in you know, holography. I suspect that that's what you've hit on by talking about the root Akinagi surface, which is the sort of non-local realization of entanglement. That's right. So it's very important to understand that in holography, what they have gotten is not that areas give entanglement. Areas in the gravity theory give entanglements of the CFT. That's very important. What, what is happening with the way they are trying to use it here in gravity, I mean, they went through a loop of you know 3D gravity with 2D boundary and all these things. But what they're trying to say is that in gravity itself, when two things are entangled with each other, then somehow the areas are going to come in automatically. We'll get some prescription from here, entanglement of two gravity things. We look for something with something. But notice here the entanglement was of a CFT region with another CFT region. And the entanglement came only because the two were actually interacting. Because they were interacting, the ground state of this entire system had entanglement between here and here. That's all that we actually got this from. And now they're trying to jump this to a situation where there is no CFT, nothing. There's one gravity region here, one gravity region here. This contains the B, this contains the C. And they have just noticed it as entangled. And they're saying, I have interactions. I can do things. 
But no, you have nothing. There's nothing you can do. But uh, I, I'd like to push back a bit on this. Uh, uh, not that I agree with the island uh, calculation in any way, but I, I sort of think there, there's something interesting here in, okay. in the way one should think about this as a paradigm shift. So you're exactly right. Everything you say, I agree with. And the idea is that there is some high energy theory which has its Hamiltonian and, and that describes degrees of freedom from which you can write down quantum entanglement entropy depending on how you slice the system into parts. Good. And then whatever is space-time geometry as an interpretation of it approximately follows. So okay. meaning that it's sort of a shift of the entire paradigm where your starting point is not space-time and try to understand how you can compute entanglement in the background of a space. But to say that there is no space time. Space time is whatever is that approximate description that we need to have to make sense of the quantum theory that underlies it. And there I, is- I agree completely. Of, I agree completely. That's what Maldus and I would like to start. That's his direction. I agree completely. Yeah, and, and what I'm trying to say is that uh, even though I don't necessarily agree with the uh, island computation, I think that paradigm shift is genuinely interesting because there are independent indications that space time as a notion may not be a robust thing and perhaps our struggle over decades to quantize the graviton is a red herring because uh, it's sort of an emergent phenomena. So, so at the end of the day, I think what I like about the island story, modulo the details which have pro are problematic as you've described, is the general idea to flip the problem on its back and say the starting point is some quantum theory that is underlying gravity or anything. And entanglement is defined between the degrees of freedom of this quantum theory, which has a grand Hamiltonian call it, I don't know, matrix theory or M theory. And then uh, space time emerges from this and it can be some convoluted wormholes if they need to be to make sense of the quantum description, which is the real one. So I absolutely agree. This is what is driving Maldasina because since he started with ADS CFT, he likes to think of the CFT as being something simple and explicit and in principle solvable, though not practically solvable. And then the bulk description should emerge as some kind of an approximation. So he indeed wants to think of gravity as emerging from some underlying complicated degrees of freedom. So I totally agree with you. This is what he would like to think. And it also can be called interesting. I think what has happened is that he then went in the wrong direction. So let me be very categorical about it. It's wrong and not just you know, uh, you know, possible or plausible. And the mistake I think that he's making is the following. We know that if you take large number of D3 brains, which is what he started with, then that is a dynamics of open strings between them and it's very complicated. And this dynamics can be replaced by the dynamics of you know, just empty ADS where it looks like smooth space time. Right? So that's the ADS CFT that he discovered. But it works only sort of locally. If you have, let's say a million D brains, then you get an ADS, which is let's say, you know, a million units in radius and up to there, whatever is happening here, is happening here and you can make a one-to-one -one map. If you go very far from this region out to flat space, millions of miles away from this ADS, then actually there is nothing to do with these open degrees of freedom. They didn't tell you, don't tell you anything about the gravity. Okay. So the ADS CFT as it came was between these, whatever was happening on the deep brains here in the open string description and the ADS, which is, this is flat space far away. So far away, there was nothing to do with it, but just this part was captured by the ADS region. And up to here, it was fine. And the emergent physics of these open degrees of freedom was the emergence of gravity over here. I think by pushing this to a domain where things can be arbitrarily far into flat space region by saying that doesn't matter how far I go, whatever I'm doing with my brains has to have an impact on things which are entangled this far away. He went into a direction where he is now forced to say that if I have two entangled things, one coming from these deep brains here, and one coming from these D brains here, if I entangle these bits with these bits, 
I will actually generate little threads between them. But there's a lot of flat space here in between, right? These guys have an ADS, these guys have an ADS. These degrees of freedom can be mapped to this ADS. These degrees of freedom can be mapped to this ADS. If I entangle some guys here with each other, that is something here. If I entangle these guys with each other, that is something here. Up to here, nobody would doubt it. The trouble he has gotten into is that if I give you 100 deep brains in California and you're sitting with them, and I have 100 deep brains in my room and I'm sitting with them here, by linearity of quantum mechanics, I can take a state which is entangled between your open string excitations and my open string excitations. And now the whole game starts. As far as I'm concerned, or any fuzzball person would say, he would say, I simply have some gravity fuzzball here, some gravity fuzzball here. I have I different fuzzballs. I want to I n fuzzballs here. I have I want to I n fuzzballs here. And my entire state is just, you know, sorry, I want this is J1 to J n. I want tensor J1 plus I2 tensor J2. You simply have a superposition of two different pieces of code, just like two different pieces of code entangle. And that's all. There's nothing new. Locally, these 100 brains could be mapped to this. These 100 brains could be mapped to this. They're just pieces of coal. Your coal and my coal are simply entangled. There's no physical connection between us. But Malzina has now gotten himself into a situation where he'll say no. Because of this entanglement, the same threads which he was trying to run around in trying to visualize space time emerging within the ADS, he's now running them across arbitrary distances. So he will say, doesn't matter. California is very far away from Columbus. Now there is stuff going between your place and my place. And he's trying to pull this into the solution of the black hole puzzle. So even forget the black hole, I think it's already wrong. And so we can see it already from, just to repeat what I was saying, just take 100 deep brains here. 100 is more than once, it should be good enough for, you know, 1% approximation, 99% good approximation. You take 100 deep brains, I take 100 deep brains. You make your local ADS pit, I make my local ADS pit. We know how to do D1, D5 systems explicitly, right? So let's just do it. I'll get a little D1, D5 geometry here. I get D1, D5 geometries here. I can make everything I do here, I can see here, they do here, I can see here. But this is uh, 3,000 miles, whatever the distance is between you and us, right? And now we can entangle these states with these, which is equal to entangling with these with these. But I would claim there's no physical connection. I can only get what I get with entangled spins from here to here. No way of transferring bits from this to this. I can't do anything on this gravity or on this to influence this or this. And Malzner is supposed to introduce interactions. That's where the whole difference is. I understand your point. Just a, a small correction to your calculation. I'm actually located in Paris, so, so it's, it's, yes. I think that also goes to the heart of this issue of you know how many different species of photons are there. If you actually have a Hamiltonian connecting these two systems, Absolutely. then you expect the spectrum to shift. And you know, is is an entangled photons are beautifully linear and they're both massless. But if you have a Hamiltonian that's mixing them through some wormhole then the spectrum is going to shift all over the place. And you've got many, many different species of objects. Absolutely. And, and I think that's, that's the conundrum. The minute you say, I've got a Hamiltonian driving an interaction, now you've got to ask, what's the spectrum of states? Whereas if you're just entangling states with an acute quantum field theory, everything's still massless. They're just entangled. Anyway, just another. Stan, Stan's been trying to ask a question. Sorry. Uh, yes, sorry. Um, so I'd like to come back to the point, uh, Samir, you, you were making where you had the, CF, the CFT on the boundary with, the, with some gravity in the bulk, yeah. and you had some portion of the CFT entangled with some, with some other portion. And so the state, so if I, I want to make sure that I understand things correctly, is it true to say that the statement A is entangled with A complement yeah. is equivalent with a statement that there is a gravitational dual in the bulk and if i were to push it even further that this gravitational dual would have a black hole would that be a correct statement so i didn't understand everything i understood up to the last step so right now this original Takanagi statement was for the case where the ads is in the vacuum mm -hmm. the vacuum of gravity the boundary is in the vacuum of the cft and because there's a Hamilton coupling points to neighboring points in the CFT, you can still compute the entanglement of this part of the CFT with the remaining part of the CFT, and we call it S of A. In the bulk, it's given by the area of this minimal surface, which I'll write as script A upon 4G. So it's very important there was no black hole anywhere. Because the moment you start putting excitations here to make 
even not even a black hole, just put some excitations here, then they correspond to also excitations over here. And then the Rutakanagi didn't work. But so they started making corrections to Rutakanagi. Yeah, when, go ahead. When, when, when you draw this diagram, are you committed that the ground state of the gravitational theory can't be degenerate, which means that you don't have a black hole? Yes, I think they are committed to that because this is just empty ADS and empty ADS has a unique ground state. And this is, this is oh, that unique. So, so this is, so in fact, this, so this is where, because this is the difference because I, if I understand that, that therefore correctly, the idea would have been that all, that the, that the, that the property of, entangle, of entanglement of the boundary, in the boundary theory is inevitably equivalent to a, uh, a gravitational to the fact that the boundary theories are in fact interacting with a bulk and that is why they're entangled and it is this statement that in fact is not true in general yeah right? so I think I, let me see if i understand what you're saying but i think i am agreeing with what you're saying if right now here the boundary is enclosing a bulk nothing is very far from each other in the sense that any part of the bulk can interact with the boundary and boundary is interacting with the boundary bulk can interact with the boundary so interactions are everywhere and these interactions are crucial. All the entanglements are coming Indeed. because of interactions. So where, would, so where would your 1,000 D3 brains be? In so in this case, the 1,000 D3 brains, let's say, are representing the boundary CFT. The boundary CFT has, is described by, let's say, 1,000 D3 brains, which means it is SU-1000 gauge theory. So this would be the, the theory at Columbus. This is the theory at Columbus. And then there's and, another and, one. And you could not have an, on the same diagram the theory in California. So That's you, right. So you That's need right. another diagram for the theory in California. Another diagram. This is the California theory. And this one has the uh, its own 1000 D3 brains, own SU1000. If they were in the same region, there can be lots of interaction, lots of things can happen. We have to look at the dynamics. But we are not talking about that. That would be if they put the three brains on top of each other, it would be SU2000 because the OPCs can go from one to the other and they're all interacting. But the whole point is that nothing to do with the black hole problem. Maltra was two different things. Let's say these are the C quanta is the P quanta. This is far away at infinity. This is the black hole. And between here and here is 3000 miles. And now, but you can still entangle these guys, their state, state of this boundary with the state of this boundary. And so this is it's nice you ask this question because it's exactly the way the question has come with all these papers, including the, you know, uh, Douglas Stanford, Schenker et al. papers. They also go through this argument. Let's do exactly that. Let's take some brains here and that's dual to this. Let's take these brains here and that's dual to this. But let's consider a state where these brains are entangled with these brains. Okay, so not the ground state because you can't entangle a ground state to another ground state. It'll just be factored. We we'll put some excitations here. We we'll put some excitations here and make an entangled state. But they are very far from each other. So entangled, but no Hamiltonian. And then what I would say is you just have some gravity thing entangled, some gravity if you want the gravity language, or some you know brains with some brains but no interaction, just entanglement, just linearity, nothing interesting. Well, these people are saying that no, from here to here, there'll be a wormhole which connects the interior of this to this. Mm -hmm. You can even go through it. Just because you entangle them, there's a nice tube from here to Paris and I can go to Paris. I'll make these debrains. I'll well, jump. They, they say that, that, that uh, well, the, a lot of this intuition is driven by this gouge of Ferris wall construction. Yes where it's not just entanglement, but you know, you take the entangled state and you make a small perturbation to the Hamiltonian and you make something that looks like a traversable wormhole. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, and indeed is not just the entanglement, but to make the, the, the quote unquote wormhole that you've made through the entanglement traversable, you need to indeed include some kind of small uh, interaction between the the two uh, conformal field theories, but that 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 is sufficient to make something that looks like you can transfer information, um, quote unquote, through the bulk through some wormhole. Right. So, for the classical interaction, that they, they, what they do is they introduce a classical interaction for that because they were going through information theory, right? They establish a phone line between these two places by which they can actually send data classically. Right, because they're trying to quantify yes. the leap, right? So, yes. so it's just like if I put a single phone line on which I will send classical electromagnetic waves between my, let's say, B quanta and C quanta, 
that classical automatic wave doesn't carry much entropy. So I'm not actually removing the entanglement through that channel. But using that classical channel, they want to actually send the information through this protocol. That's right. But they still need that more. It's not like, it's not normal for this. I'm saying they still need the more more physics. Well, it, I mean, the, they can do a calculation on both sides, right? They can do some calculation in the field theory uh, where it just looks like you have a phone line and then they can do some geometry calculation and uh, it looks for all practical purposes like they're the same thing. Yeah, so, so then let's talk about it separately when I have the paper in front of me. It's been a while since I read that, but uh, I don't think they can actually send something from one to I think they were just doing quantum teleportation of normal bodies. So what happened in that paper was in the first part of the paper, what they're writing down is just a normal quantum teleportation pro, uh, procedure as seen in Nielsen and Chuang or something. You have two bodies, they're just ordinary bodies. You have a classical phone line and you can do quantum teleportation. Okay, yeah. so that has nothing to do with actually sending something over, right? That doesn't remove any entanglement or anything. So they were just doing quantum teleportation. And then in the second part of the paper, then they sort of start mumbling words that now in this situation, we have actually managed to send something from here to here. And actually there's no connection between the two things because quantum teleportation doesn't actually send anything. Like if I have a phone line from me to you, but I also have the whole black hole puzzle where my black hole evaporated and you've collected the quanta. If you then try to show, show me how using the classical phone line where we can communicate, you can actually move the entanglement between B and C it's not possible because B and C are just entangled. The entanglement to B and C can't be removed with separate unity transformations of this and this, which is all that the quantum teleportation protocol does. So how did they actually get the information out of the hole or remove the entanglement? That was again, the words of there being a traversable wormhole because there was some negative energy. They opened the wormhole, sent it to the wormhole. That part actually had nothing to do with the quantum teleportation, which was just the ordinary part they copy out from Nielsen Chua. So to summarize your previous comment is, is, is really the whole point about um, how it, is the poison pill in this whole thing flat space. The minute you've got some flat space, all of this sort of you know, ADS CFT procedure breaks down and the ability to actually run a wormhole or pretend you've got a wormhole just disappears because once you've got a big chunk of flat space and there's a very long distance between you and, and the other quantum system, there is no way the correlations can be can be can persist, um, it, uh, except through some kind of strange Hamiltonian interaction. Can't I embed this whole discussion in an arbitrarily weakly curved ADS? <laughs> uh, this is possibly true. Um, but let me just first answer the next question. That's exactly for me. That's hundred percent the answer. I mean, because okay. I so then then I'll, then answer a Mill's question because he's got me caught me flat footed. <laughs> Two. Go ahead. So what was Emil's question again? Like you have one weakly coupled ADS, a very big ADS, and yes. then you put some thousand D-brains here and a thousand D-brains here. I, I was appealing to the fact that flat space seems to be the poison pill. And Emil was pointing out that there's a slightly poison pill, which is, which is a very big ADS. Yeah, so, so I've taken a very big ADS. Mm -hmm. and that ADS, I put a thousand D-brains here, which made a local dip here. I put a thousand D-brains here, with which I made a local dip here. So I know that these are exactly some D1, D5 gravity and the gravity solutions also. I know the gravity solutions here also. And a lot of flat space or almost flat space in between. I can do that. My conclusion would be the same. I would say that just the fact this is all gentle ADS uh, shouldn't do anything. Uh, and this guy will have nothing to do with this guy. Then you can say, but they're all sitting in one ADS in the CFT. They're all in the same CFT. Could there not be some delicate connection between them? through the CFT, and I would say there shouldn't be, but if you look at the CFT and you try to prove that, it'll be very hard because that's the whole problem with ADS CFT. You can put everything in the CFT, but the CFT can't speak back to you because you can't analyze SU1 million CFT. But if you put the SU1 million CFT in the computer, I would say that this has nothing to do with this and you actually can't actually get an effective one out through this. If you say, how do you show me that because I put everything in the CFT and maybe the CFT has some crazy interactions, then that's equal to saying you do want these crazy wormholes on the dual gravity. I don't believe it is true, but then it was your fault, I would say, for putting it on the big CFT and making someone try to solve it through the CFT, which is an awful way of solving a gravity question. I mean, 
you put something in the CFT, but then I can't solve that CFT, then I can't answer it. I, I, mean, I, will, I want to sort of add that I don't think it's all just ADS CFT, right? It's sort of in the context of the more general idea of gravitational holography, which exists in all kinds of brain throat regions. And, and it does not, Ryu Takaranagi takes a very concrete, clear form in ADS CFT, but the idea of holography is much more general. And I think as long as you have the idea of a holography, you have this notion that you have a quantum theory where you can define quantum entanglement with quantum degrees of freedom. And then there could be a dual geometrical description, which is approximate, which can be valid sometimes, let's say. So, so then it allows for redefining entanglement through a quantum theory with its own Hamiltonian and geometry being an emergent phenomena. For example, a flat space uh, case is the light cone flat space of M theory. And there you have the dual as a matrix theory that we know. So you could ask the same questions there. You can compute an entanglement in matrix theory and ask yourself, well, what does geometry have to do with this entanglement? So I think I would say that the red heading in this whole thing is entanglement because ADS CFT was fine. It just said if you have lots of open strings and you know you make a blob of open strings, then if you wait for some time, the blob just spreads to a larger size, right? The open strings sort of diffuse. So a blob this big becomes a blob this big. And the effective dynamics of this is that you had put some kind of a string loop here, and after some time it goes here. So this dynamics of the string falling in can be mapped to this thing sort of expanding in the CFT, and that was ADS CFT duality. Here's gravity interactions, which make it move from one place to the other. Here it was the open string interaction made the move, Yang Mills, but in both cases, there was a one-to-one -one map. This was all Hamiltonians. This was the open string description. You just take the open string and you map them and look at them in the closed string channel, you start seeing this. Nothing deep about it, just open closed duality with a large number of brains. You can see the dynamics in this language in the open string channel. It looks like this in the closed string channel, nothing to do with entanglement. The whole entanglement thing, I think, is the red herring because then these people saw that one thing you can also see in ADS CFT is that when you take the vacuum of the boundary, as we were saying, and you want, I want the entanglement of A with A complement, it's given by the area of this. Okay, that will be some answer, it comes out of this. But the entanglement was generated by the Hamiltonian stiff, right? If this point was not interacting with this point, there would be no entanglement. Okay, because when they're interacting, the ground state is like of two coupled oscillators, it automatically becomes entangled. So now if you start saying that, then you start, so you say, okay, ADS CFT was fine. Using that, I can also compute entanglements. That's also fine. And then you say, entanglements are important. So whenever I see entanglements, I will start saying that geometry is connecting points to points. And I think that's not fine because that's what I think is the jump these people are making. But I think that contradicts the linearity of quantum mechanics. So that's what I've been trying to argue about that, you know. If you take something with, let's say, one spin up and one spin down, system one, system two, and suppose it evolves to some final state, psi one. And then if you take the other one, this is down, this is up, and it evolves to some state, psi two. This was not entangled, this was not entangled. So suppose nothing interesting happened. And if you take the linear superposition of up, down, plus down, up, nothing interesting can happen because it has to go to psi one plus psi two by linearity. So just the linearity of quantum mechanics tells you that entanglement is not exciting. The moment you know the set of all factorized states between system one and system two, if you know a complete set of factorized bases, psi i tensor chi j, and you know what happens to them after evolution, you know their evolution, whatever happens to entangled states, summation i comma j, ci j, psi i tensor chi j, is known exactly by linearity, there is no new joy anymore. So these guys are going on a completely wrong track. There is nothing you can get out of entanglement, whatever you do. Factorized systems already hold the whole information. If you know the Hamilton evolution of a factored system, you know everything about the entangled system. So they were good up to here. ADS CFT didn't have a problem. With ADS CFT, the fact that you can compute the entanglement entropy is no problem. But then you start converting entanglement to a principle and you suddenly realize that it actually makes no sense because entanglement cannot do anything for you. Whatever factored things can do, by linearity hold all the information of what an entangled thing can do. 
So if you start building space-time by entanglement, what on earth is going on? Because this is what the their problem is. So in fact, I wrote a small note. If anybody wants, I can send it around. But I show how there is a conflict between the QES principle and entanglement. And the linearity of quantum mechanics, because you try to do the QS principle, you take non-entangled states like these, and you find there's no entanglement, so the QS surface is zero. You take the linear combination of those states, and now there's entanglement, you find the QS surface must be big. The QS prescription doesn't even respect linearity. But that's just a small example of this generic problem. There was no reason for all the people who were doing ADS CFT to suddenly jump up and start shouting entanglement every day. Entanglement has nothing to do with anything. It's just that this is the only time they saw entanglement that you can compute it in this way. And then they said it's a principle. I don't think it's any principle because entanglement never teaches you anything. But okay, if they want to say it's a principle, it's fine. I'm only saying what, where does it bring them to the end? And the end has brought them to the fact that when a black hole evaporates, there are two kinds of photons. When a piece of coal evaporates, you get photons like this. When a black hole evaporates, you get photons which have these links connected to them. If you're willing to live with that and you think that's the correct physics, it's consistent, whatever your motivations. This, that this is the output, that there are two kinds of photons at infinity. That I'm insisting on because I can prove that by whatever I know about black holes. So everything else we just arguing is philosophy because one could like one thing or one could like another thing. But the fact that there are two different things about what will happen in a standard like experiment, if you make a black hole and evaporate it a thousand black masses at CERN, first person will give you one answer like this and black holes will give you another answer for the stern lack. That is physics. We can do it at CERN. We can probably do it in principle in 50 years. And these are opposite answers. Mm. Nick, we can't hear you. Yes, I, I said we should probably wrap up fairly soon. So if there are any last questions, I mean, we've heard uh, from... Go yeah, ahead. I can have a short question. So so if we just assume that something non-unitary non happens inside a black hole, then how does that change the entanglement entropy? So that can solve the problem. Solve means then that's what Hawking said, right? You have all yes. these B1 to Bn, and they were entangled with the C1 to Cn. Mm -hmm. What Hawking said was that all these, the state just mapped to one state, the vacuum of the C quanta. So then you're only left with the B quanta, but now they are, still in an entangled state. If you pass them through a stern girl act, they will not look like a pure state. And you just live with that. I mean, there's no remnant because you have the vacuum, but the answer is that you will pass them through a stern girl act and find them to not be in a pure state. And that is a possible answer to what happens. It's not a resolution in the sense it won't bring you the information out. It won't make this a pure state, but it's a possible evolution of these systems. Uh, right. No, but we have discussed that as long as there is unitary evolution for the black hole as well as for the radiation that's outside, uh, we still have entropy to be infinite, right? We? we still have it what? Like, so do we still have this problem? Like, uh, you know, the entropy that we obtained was infinite for uh, this case as well, right? So we didn't understand. If you, if you make the black hole evaporate like Hawking, you will have an infinite number of B, infinite number of Cs. You can do that. Keep feeding the black hole. You can entangle it as much as you want. If you let the black hole evaporate, Hawking would say it's non-unitary. So you can map many Cs to one C. You can still have an arbitrary large entanglement entropy for the Bs. And that is, if you call that a problem, it's still a problem. Absolutely. No. Uh, so for, so for the, so I think, so we found the infinite entropy even, so if we just assume that whatever uh, is reaching the singularity is just, you know, vanishing. So what do we, uh, what, so do all the other states that are, you know, the radiation that was outside was it now, is it in a pure state or entangled? Entangled. Because we have never considered that uh, these will vanish, right? We have never considered that as, as soon as they reach a the singularity, they will vanish. Like we have never considered that fact. We just considered that as long as uh, these, there are really infinitely many states on the space like slice that was, uh, that we've drawn the Penrose diagram. Yes. We have never considered that these things will vanish, right? So we can never say that, uh, you know, it will be entangled still, even after they vanish. So we can consider that. We didn't talk much about it, but we can. We can evolve this slice so that it comes closer to the singularity. And we can say that at that point it vanishes. We don't have to look at the good slice. We can look at a slice where it goes to singularity. And then we can use Hawking's idea that it does vanish. The only reason we didn't bother to spend much time on that 
is that whatever happens inside the black hole doesn't change what happens to the bees because so if the bees are not being affected, if there are no wormholes going there or anything, if the bees are not affected, then if I pass them through a stern girl like, I will still find them in the big state. So if you want, you can leave it here on this big slice or you can make the big slice go to the singularity and you can replace it by one state, the vacuum. Since it won't affect what happens to the bees, we didn't talk much about it. But Hawking talked about exactly this and he did say the bees would be in a big state. Okay, okay. thank you. Any last quick questions or last comments? Okay, so I just want to thank Samir again for this mammoth effort on his part and also from the students, um, Meta and uh, from Bin. It's been really great. And so thank you for doing this. And uh, a reminder that next week is the, the meeting and uh, 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 the schedule is now complete. So please, you know, take a look. I think it, but above all, it's been great, Samir. Thank you. Okay, thanks to everybody for coming and participating. <laughs>